This is a regular meeting on Thursday, February 28th. We'll call the meeting to order and let it be heard that we all of us are here. So we welcome everybody and that's the first page. See how quickly we're running through this? She'll be here sometime. Okay. Items to be taken out of order. We have the classified longevity career increments and Pat English will do this for us. Pat? Oh, okay, Lori gets to do this. Okay, President Gaskin. Okay, I'd like to uh, first ask Robert Else to come down and uh, provide, okay. Is, no? Got it, all right, <laughs> not oh, no. a problem. And um, I don't uh, see the other individual, Francisco. So. So why don't we just go on and then yes. let us know though right, as soon we'll as you see you them come in. This, uh, yes. Okay. Okay, that works. We're too much on time. Now, oh, Sally Green's here. Good. Measure V annual report from the chair of the Measure V committee. Ms. Green. Oh, hearing of citizens. I'm sorry. No, no. We got this ahead of it. Okay. I usually listen to her, but right. I'm not going to this <laughs> one. Yes. Thanks, Sally. Good afternoon, Welcome. board members and President Gaskin. So I am the chairperson of the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee, which was established after the passage of Measure B in 2008. The overwhelming passage of that bond provided $77 million to Santa Barbara City College for use on facility projects, which were on a much looked at and planned long-range facilities plan. The, um, we have some new committee members and we have some old committee members and I would like to acknowledge them. So just recent, just last fall, these members left our board. Joe Bailey, Ed Heron, Mark Levin, and the student representative, Olga Smith. Our new members are Bernice James, Charles Tobe Plough, Jack Ostrander, Michael Just, and Ellie Katzenson, and Lee Moldover and I are from the past committee. The committee has um, been presented by staff and administration with completed, with the completed projects and ongoing projects while making sure that establishing the funds are not used for teacher or administrative salaries or for operating expenses. Just last week, the committee reviewed the audit at our, annual, at our meeting and found that all procedures were noted with no exceptions and with appropriate expenditures. As you well know, many projects have been completed. Others are in the planning stages and others are waiting for approval from various agencies. The, the Citizens Oversight Committee remains committed to the success of the college and will continue to monitor and provide reports on the status of the Measure B bond, bond program. Through judicious use of Measure B funds, the bond program will allow SBCC to continue to educate students and prepare for the future by replacing and supplementing existing, existing college infrastructure. And I would just like you to know that this committee is a variety of people who come from many fields and are very competent to look at what is provided to us on a regular basis. And for the record, I need to read to you, which I know you have. It is our opinion, based upon the committee's oversight activities and a review of the independent financial and performance audits, that the district is in compliance with the requirements of Article 13A, Section 1B3 of the California Constitution. With the presentation of the annual report, the Bond Oversight Committee members assure voters that Measure B bond expenditures have been properly made and have been utilized for projects consistent with those identified in the bond measure. It is our sincere hope that you will find this annual report informative and comprehensive. Thank you. I appreciate all the work you do on this and the whole committee because I don't think you're getting big bucks for it. No. Uh, but we, we really appreciate you making sure that the dollars the taxpayer dollars are going where they're supposed to be going. I will pass it on to the members. Good, thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. 
Is it a go yet? It's a go. <laughs> We're back to the classified longevity career increments. Okay, and I would like to ask Robert Else to come up to introduce Melanie Rogers. Thank you, President Bloom, members of the board, President Gaskin. I am very happy for this opportunity to uh, honor Melanie Rogers on the occasion of her 10-year anniversary at Santa Barbara City College. When Melanie came here after serving four and a half years at CSU Northridge, she instantly doubled the size of the IR department, institutional research, which was then solely inhabited by Dr. Andrea Serban. Melanie also instantly inherited a tremendous workload but her powers of work and concentration were amply demonstrated since she had only a cubicle in an open area of the busiest office in the admin building among the copy machine, the network printer, and three other offices, and I honestly don't know how she survived. And I finally concluded that instead of a cone of silence, she has a cone of concentration mm -hmm. that, that is like a force field. And she did amazing things during those, during those years in the midst of the hubbub. It wasn't until 2007 when institutional research moved to the first floor of the admin building under the direction of Darla Cooper that Melanie got some peace and quiet, but even then it was a front-facing office with many people stopping by to say hello, ask directions, or grab a piece of candy from the bowl on the counter. So we took away the candy. In 2009, Melanie finally got her own office. However, in the meantime, she also got two new children and uh, Benjamin and Rebecca, they're not here, but her family is here today. Uh, so now she needs her cone of concentration again. And I feel that Santa Barbara City College has given her training in that area. You know, I was gonna read her job description, but we don't have time. There are, it's amazing, just some of the verbs, assist, receive, analyze, develop, implement, upload, download, attend, participate, prepare, deliver, and of course, other duties as assigned. Melanie carries out these skills with uh, accuracy, insight, and grace. Uh, the, other three, the three other people in the department are, have primarily, primarily information technology backgrounds, and Melanie brings the research, knowledge, and experience to our office, which is very valuable. The Aspen Institute deemed Santa Barbara <coughs> City College a top 10 Aspen school based based largely on our use of research and data to drive decision making. And more often than not, it's Melanie's data that we're using. So I personally thank you, Melanie, and we all thank you for your contributions and hard work at Santa Barbara City College. Okay, just wanted to share a few thoughts. Um, thank you, Robert. Uh, coming to Santa Barbara City College is one of the few times in my life where I, I clearly felt the hand of God guiding me, and I feel very blessed to be here. I remember the day that I interviewed with Andrea for this position very well. It was a beautiful sunny day, much like today, and by the time I left her office, I felt like I was walking on sunshine, as I was almost certain that I would be offered the job. I was very excited by the prospect of working at a college with such a strong reputation and I took a few moments to enjoy the view as I imagined what it would be like to spend my work days on this beautiful campus. I was equally, equally excited by the prospect of returning to my hometown with familiar places, family, and friends. During the interview, Andrea asked about my plans for the future and whether I could see myself staying here for at least three years. Mm -hmm. I assured her that I could absolutely see myself staying here for more than three years, and I still feel that way today. I have a deep appreciation for all of my dedicated and talented colleagues who make this college the excellent institution that it is, and I feel fortunate to have a loving family that has supported and encouraged me all along. In the last 10 years, I've experienced much personal and professional growth. I've had some great accomplishments and faced some challenges and changes as well, but I still feel blessed and I'm grateful every day to be a part of this very special college community. Thank you. Thank you.
second uh, honoree, Norma Bahina. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Francisco Martin Del Campo. I work at Continuing Education. I'm the director of our technology and uh, registration uh, system. And uh, Norma has been um, with the college for over 15 years, as you, as you, as you noted. Um, her years have been very productive, and she's a great asset for our division, for our Continuing Education Division, this college and this community. We started with what we call the program, it's called Computers in Our Future. It was a community technology centers program, a grant, uh, a private grant who, for which we competed uh, statewide that uh, John Romo, our, our then vice president of continuing ed, uh, put together and, and won over many other um, competitors. So we were able to get this um, grant, private grant from the Wellness Foundation. It's a five year digital divide uh, grant. It was created to promote family wellness through development of technology skills. Norma was hired to make um, sure that our computer labs and our instructors uh, were there to serve our students, especially bilingual underserved families. The five-year plan of the program was to branch out and create a, con a community partners and to bring the, the community technology centers concept to the neighborhoods from Carpinteria to Galita. Norma was critical in creating and executing what we called the youth computer academies. And those were taking young people as part of the family concept, taking young people, teaching them computer repair, computer applications, and then in turn, the computers that they repaired were then given to nonprofit organizations as one of the the working with community aspect that we had. We actually had nine community partners after this time period were able to create partnerships. We had labs at the Shot and Wake Centers, Boys and Girls Clubs of Santa Barbara, the East and West Side, Girls Inc. of Carpinteria, Transition House, La Casa de la Raza, Ivy Teen Center, and the Small Business Administration Hispanic Council um, Center on Milpa Street. More recently, Norma and the bilingual computer instructors were given a task to develop computer certificate programs. So she has been working all this time creating um, oppor learning opportunities for our, for our community. The uh, certificate programs that, she's, that she and her staff have, have uh, instructional staff have put together, um, fundamental computer skills, uh, office computer applications essentials, office computer applications, desktop publishing principles, fundamentals of graphics and web design offered in both English and in Spanish. I'm proud to call her my colleague and I wish her many more years working for the college and contributing to the success of the students in our college district. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Gaskin, members of the board, thank you very much for, first of all, for the opportunity to be here. I am kind of didn't want to come, but then I decided I should because it's a great um, opportunity that I have had for many, many, many years. First, as an hourly employee at the credit division, so, and also as, a, as an alumna of the college. So with that background, I think I have a uh, that has helped me understand and, and kind of help our students and support our students and provide the services and continue to provide the services that will help them achieve their goals and become um, better members or improve their uh, living standards in our community. I want to uh, I want to tell you that I part of my privilege and I the part of the reason I have enjoyed working with the college is because I have had. I can say for many years, the best supervisor anybody can have asked for was Francisco Martin Del Campo. He's been a great uh, supporter of a student success. He's always put the students first and then helped me and supported me in anything, any challenge. I'm not saying 
I have enjoyed my ride in City College, but it's never been smooth. It's been rough sometimes, but I think with the support of a, such a great person that now I can call my colleague and friend, Francisco. I want to say thank you, Francisco, for everything that he's done for me. I have learned so much with under his leadership, and uh, I wish, I hope I can continue to work with him in many other areas. So thank you, City College, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Mary. Okay, thank you so much. It's always good to hear people's stories, so that's fun. Uh, we have next hearing of citizens, and we have Vanessa Patterson. We just did a video. Um, it was perfect. <laughs> we were dancing and, and in our chairs, and, and Peter had a, a line to say, and he did a good job. So tell us why we did that, Vanessa. <laughs> well, I think Peter's auditioning for his new career in rap. Oh, good. And all of you as backup, um, <laughs> backup <Rappers>. singers. <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, we're about ready to embark on the most important fundraising initiative of our year, which is our campaign for student success. And I have to say, this is our third campaign for student success. And when we look at the trend line since we had our first campaign for student success, we've increased our active donor base by over 300%. And we've elevated our fundraising by um, almost 200% uh, since uh, the same time period. So we have taken on a 40% increase in our goal this year, as you know, and we're on track. And it's um, in light of the spirit of what's just been taking place, I just have to say it's because of the team I get the opportunity to work for, work with, and um, it, it, both at SBCC and um, in the foundation with Gretchen and Surf Media and so many others. I have a few things for your kickoff. Not only have you probably received your invitations, but I brought extras for your friends. You also each have t-shirts with either a pink heart or a green heart or a pink heart that you have to come by the foundation office and pick up. Um, and each of you have your own special car magnet that can go to advertise at City College wherever you are. So I'm going to leave your uh, specialized campaign gear, the campaign kickoff, which all of you are invited to attend, um, is going to be a phenomenal event. And Becca Saladin, who's a recent graduate of SBCC, will be performing live with her band. We'll see the debut of and this tremendous song that uh, Dean Doug Hirsch and so many students have participated actively in. We have phenomenal food with the, our own culinary program, the Burger Bus, McConnell's, Marmalade, uh, the list goes on and on, and uh, so much more. Our art department, um, all the art departments have participated in all campus Show Us Your Love art competition. So uh, the winner will be announced that night. So I hope you'll join us. And I'm, that's about it. Oh, other thing, for all the alum in the room, our Alumni Association is giving away a free mini iPad that was donated to the foundation by our new alumni and volunteer coordinator, Mike Flores. And we hope that we can expand our Alumni Association to 20,000 by the end of this next year. And you might want to tell us when the kickoff is. Oh, March 15th, uh, mark your calendar, March 15th. The kickoff runs from 5 to 6.30, and starting at 4.15, we'll have our own student rally. And um, Marty, I'm going to be talking to you, but both you and, and Lori, I'd love to have uh, Dr. Gaskin and uh, Marty Bloom, I'd love for you to speak at that event. Thanks so much. That. We'll speak briefly. We know how to do that, right? No, that's wonderful. And uh, all of us will be at that kickoff in the gym. Yes, in the sports pavilion, yes. and we have valet parking, so anyone that's afraid of parking, um, that will be provided for all of you. That's why we ran Andrew. for office, so we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank so, you thank so you much. Thank you so much. That's going to be fun, and I appreciate all the energy that's going into this, and the idea is just to get some money for kids, for books, for, for tuition, for all kinds of things that they need. 
Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. And thanks again. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you all there. And come by and pick up your T-shirt and your very own car magnets. <laughs> wow. No, that's good. I appreciate all that work. Anybody else? Okay. Um, we have a couple more people who would like to speak at Hearing of Citizens. Linda Nelson to be followed by Eleanor Burns Larson. <coughs> And then Kathy McCammon after that. Honorable trustees and President Gaskin, I'm a member of the CLL, the Center for Lifelong Learning Work Group. Firstly, I wish to thank you for confirming Dr. Andrew Harper as our new executive director with the Center for Lifelong Learning. We are thrilled to have our first choice, an individual who we are confident will serve the community with distinction. Secondly, I wish to address the issue of FTES bearing courses. Just four weeks ago, I addressed our chair, Dr. Mark Ferrer, and the CLL work group to remind them that, funding, that state funding for education comes and goes. It's like surfing. Presently, we're in a trough. We should not believe that state funding and the budget will never rise. The tide does come in. Allow the CLL to retain the ability to house FTES bearing courses. Do not absorb all FTES courses into the credit side. Please don't shut the door and please do no harm. I know many students, and on the subject of student success, I'm switching subjects here, I know many students who start out on the adult ed side. They are excited with their new skills and begin to dream of new possibilities. Many of them are so energized by their success that they take classes at the college, start certificate programs, and earn a new degree. Student success comes in many forms. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Eleanor Burns Larson, followed by Kathy McCammon. Hello, my name is Eleanor Burns Larson, a co-president of ACES and a CE student. We are alarmed the college is wasting apportionment that it could have been getting from the state. Page 33 of the Board of Trustees agenda attachments for today shows that the FTES total for non-credit, non-enhanced is 643 lower than cap. The enhanced non-credit is also under cap and the total dollar amount that would have been paid would have been an additional $611,000 in apportionment. I totaled the FTESs claimed for all the ceramics classes in spring of 2010, and they came to 17.91. Uh, the ceramics classes given in spring of 2010 are about the same as are given currently, so the FTSs gained by making them state supported in spring 2013 should be about the same. And we understand that this is going to be done in the spring. Ceramics is going to be um, state supported. I fail to see how 18 FTSs will solve the problem of being 643 FTSs under cap. It would appear that all the arts and crafts classes would be need needed to fill the gap. It's possible that all of CE could have been state supported and therefore free to the students. This appears to have happened through a lack of attention paid by the administration and lack of Board of Trustees oversight. I've been informed that it would have been administratively inconvenient to convert all of the CE classes to state supported and therefore this money is just simply being forfeited. We're concerned that the CLL will not succeed unless greater attention is paid to the business of running an enterprise. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy McCammon is next. And the last speaker will be Robert Villanueva. McCammon. Good afternoon, board members and President Gaskin. 
I'm Kathy McCammon, and I'm a co-president of ACES. Um, I'm sure many of you have received the email that I sent out, and I apologize to the two new members if you didn't get it, because I had a few computer problems. What I'm here to talk about is what you've just heard the, the previous two speakers speak on. It is really tragic or even kind of outrageous that when we're working so hard to get people to be supportive of the CLL and to have trust in the college, to then have them find out that, oops, this money that was available, and this was probably known after Prop 30 passed by November 3rd, it's tragic that this money that could have gone to pay for classes for people in adult ed classes who you will then want to ask for money and support for the CLL, it's sad that they are being deprived of this opportunity. Um, ACES has always been for making classes affordable because we feel that there are so many students that just don't have the money to pay for the community service or fee-based classes. This money could have been used to support more of the classes, as you just heard, probably all of the arts and crafts and all the other CE classes. Um, what's kind of bad is that this isn't money that would have gone to support credit classes. This is money that we just won't get. I'm sure there are many other community colleges who have taken a strong position in support of adult ed for older adults and other classified groups. I'm sure they all will have their little hands out trying to get this money. This, is, this money is in the draft state budget, so it will go somewhere, but unfortunately not here. I think that this whole idea of just converting ceramics classes to free instead of fee-based or community service classes is really an insult to all the rest of the students who are taking other classes, and they are clearly angry about this. So like I said at the beginning, it is really tragic that this would happen and this information would be out just before we were hoping to get everyone all happy and ready to support the CLL. Thank you. Dr. Gaskin, I think uh, you wrote us an email in answer of some of this. So. Yes, and I, I really need to ask um, the speakers and the other members of the uh, wonderful CLL transition group that's been helping us plan and launch to correct these misperceptions because um, there are some inaccuracies that I need to be very clear about. We were very intentional, <coughs> purposeful, and deliberate in our FTES planning for this year. We knew that if Proposition 30 passed, there would be growth money associated with the passage in 1213. However, we chose with the full knowledge of all of the uh, participatory governance bodies to build a budget and a schedule for 1213 that assumed Proposition 30 would not pass. And as a consequence, we built our course offerings with that in mind. So summer was already completed, and it was built in a very um, conservative way. Fall schedule had 100 less course sections than the year before, again, because we were uh, building the schedule and the budget as if Prop 30 would not pass. We did that approach because to not do it would have meant we would have had to eviscerate this schedule. To build a very robust schedule on the premise that Prop 30 would have passed would have been a very serious detriment if it hadn't passed and we would have had to simply cancel classes 
by the school. When Prop 30 passed in November, the spring schedule had already been put to bed and students were enrolling. As a consequence, we knew that we would be under our funded FTES cap. And it's not leaving money on the table. It's not an accident. It's very purposeful and deliberate. And we have three years to regain that funded FTES label, uh, level. We have done that in the past. This is a very typical approach that colleges use for enrollment management because we can't turn the enrollment faucet on and off, nor do we want to. We want to be very careful and very serious about what we add back. So we're adding back, Dr. Friedlander is leading the academic programs and adding back in a very deliberate, purposeful way where the demand is high. We're building a strong summer session, a very strong fall semester, and in fact, of course, next spring. That will be year one of when we can regain that FTES, and then we have two years after that. Just to give you an idea of the delta the ability we have to regain that FTES, even with 2% growth every year, we won't reach our high watermark of credit FTES until 1516. Our high watermark of credit FTES was in 0910 at over 14,300 FTES. So we've got a large delta that we're able to fill and build back. That's why we did this transition. So with all due respect to our speakers who have worked so hard to transition this into a vibrant CLL, we absolutely were very intentional. This wasn't oops or a mistake. We built our enrollment very carefully on the idea that we would have recovery over a three-year period, which is the normal way that you manage enrollment. So I wanted to share that with you and ask if anyone had any questions. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I just Hi. might add that, that um, early in last year, the board as a whole asked the administration to budget in this fashion, to budget for Prop 30 not passing because we did not feel that it was responsible to budget not knowing whether it would pass as if it had. Um, so we asked for this kind of conservative planning um, with respect to the entire budget. Um, and indeed, I know of no other college that budgeted as if Prop 30 were going to pass. That would have been a very risky endeavor from a course offerings standpoint. Okay, okay. thank you. And we have Robert Via Nueva. Hello, I like what you're going to be talking about. <laughs> Dr. Gaspin, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come over here to uh, voice my concern. And uh, it's uh, with regards to a uh, tenured professor, uh, art history professor, uh, Manuel Nsueta's uh, mural Metamorphosis that was painted on campus adjacent to the cafeteria in 1976. I just felt compelled to come up here uh, since I had sent a letter or submitted a letter to uh, Professor Gaskin on March 8th and also to uh, Be Dean ben, ben Partee, Dr. Ben Partee, in regards to this. Uh, and I didn't get any response, so I thought I'd come out here with all due respect to. It. May I read this to you? Letter? Sure, we have a few minutes. Otherwise, um, I'll just, you know what, I don't need this. Uh, just my passion of art, that's what brought me here. Uh, for at least the last 15 years, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Unsueta has attempted, endeavored to get some funding to uh, renovate the mural that uh, he and his colleagues have uh, uh, painted back in 76, right after the Civil Rights Movement. And uh, to no avail, uh, he didn't get any funding nor any, re any response to it. So I figured as a concerned citizen and a student, by the way, thank you for uh, inviting me to Phi Theta Kappa 4.0, uh, returning student. 
God, it's been a long time since UCLA and Santa Monica College. But I, I, I just feel that some correspondence is needed because it's been years and he's been here since 1975 and it would be nice uh, for him uh, to at least be acknowledged because that is a, 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 a painting that is universal and it's multicultural and it's a part of not just this campus and the student body, it's also a part of the community in which I had spoken to people out in the community regarding this and a couple of clubs, but I'd rather stand on my own political platform, right? I mean, my own platform as an individual to address this. And uh, I'd hope that you speak with him and uh, to see what they can do. What can, because I, as a matter of principle, I believe that and, and that I do stand on principality uh, that this needs to be uh, addressed okay. and uh, some solution so resolve to this. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, it's not on our uh, agenda right now, so we can't address it, but I will definitely look into it. Uh, report by the Academic Senate. Mr. Nevins. Uh, board President Bloom, members of the board, and uh, College President Gaskin. Um, we're well underway now with the, with the uh, semester, and this is what the Senate's been up to. The first thing we've been up to is uh, we passed the use of the F grading evaluative symbol. And what that means is if a student um, fails a course and they also have not attended past the ninth week of the course, they can receive an FW, uh, which it's a special mark, which is exactly the same as an F, but it basically lets the uh, college know that the student has essentially performed an unofficial withdrawal. In other words, they've bailed on the class, not really. Um, we've also come up with some guidelines on how to use that. And uh, I see, <laughs> and uh, I was just looking at Allison Curtis to make sure that she's, I just sent her an email like two seconds ago, telling her we passed the Senate. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and hopefully that'll be implemented this summer along with plus or minus grading. So uh, that'll be useful, very useful for uh, financial aid transactions especially, and also counseling, because what it allows us to do is to see the pattern of student failure and if student failure is earned F versus withdrawal F, that those are very different kinds of situations that you want to counsel. So it actually is quite helpful. Um, the second thing we've done is uh, passed board policy uh, 4160, which is under the new numbering system 4120, which I'm sure we all know, having memorized all our uh, board policy numbers, that it refers to the uh, establishment, uh, deletion, and modification of programs. And that's passed the Senate now, and that will come forward to the board uh, sub working group, and then also in front of the full board, of course, and also BPAP. Um, the main key point about this is the establishment of a committee for doing a program review review. And this is a really important committee because what it does is it allows us to spread best practices among the different departments. Because right now, what happens now is everything is kind of evaluated in isolation, and it's a relatively effective process, but it doesn't have uh, the ability to spread the best practices across the, the college. And this will help with that. Also, if a uh, program is in trouble, we can help them get out of trouble. And if the program is inefficient, we can help them with efficiency. So there's a lot of really good things that come from this. And as a matter of fact, what was really rewarding for me personally was we went down to an ACCJC sponsored um, talk on program review and things. And they talked about what is the best practices in the state. And it's exactly what we're doing. So I, I felt very good about the process. And the, 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 the committee is involved. There's been a, number, a lot of people involved, at least 30 people, 40 faculty members involved in this process. And they've been working since last summer on this. So this is a big deal. It's been coming forward for quite a while. Um, we've looked at it four times in the Senate. So it was definitely a, of great interest to the Senate. We also uh, reviewed and passed the mission statement uh, after a very lively debate. Uh, <laughs> Some people loved it, some people didn't like it, but at the end, uh, we all came together and passed a very nice version, and that will be moving forward through the process. That's to go to CPC and the board, and it will show up here eventually. The Senate has also decided to take upon itself, they want to look at everything now, they want to look at the core principles, they want to look at our charter, and we're going to start looking at everything, and that will come forward uh, also. We're, we're not shy, that's for sure. And then, uh, finally, um, I'm very pleased to announce that we finally will get a chance to have our joint meeting. Uh, it's a joint meeting between the Board of Trustees, the Student Senate, and the Academic Senate. So I'm very, very happy. This has taken a while. Peter and I have been talking about this for a year at least, and so finally I got a chance to kind of grind it all together. And the date is March the 7th, 2013. I know it's very soon. <laughs> um, it was either the 7th or the 21st. 21st is too late. 7th is too early. I always pick too early. Uh, the time is 4 to 
and it's at ECC 30. And I'd like to thank Dr. Gaskin for uh, picking up the tab. Oh, no. <laughs> it's not, believe me, light, when I say light refreshments, you could put them in a balloon. Uh, yeah, very light refreshments. Can you give me the date and time again? It's uh, March the 7th, 2013. Next Thursday. 4 to 5 30, next Thursday, ECC 30. Good. I'm glad you did it. This is good. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to do it. I'm really looking forward because it's great for us to see each other and kind of talk about what our issues facing each other. And of course, we'll have to put out the proper notification for the public. Right. Next. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you? Uh, help me understand more effectively the benefits of the differential between the FW and the F. Okay. okay. Um, I do not know. I don't think it was me. Uh, I don't, well, first off, an FW is an F. It is zero grade points. It actually is an F. It's just basically um, an F with a little... With the grade, for grade point average? I'm sorry? Is it part of the grade point? Absolutely. It is an F. It's just like an F, but it indicates that a student is getting an F. It's not an earned F. It's kind of a little flag you put by the F saying, hey, this person did not actually, not only did they not do the work, because it is an F, so that's an evaluative grade, so they didn't do the work, but they also have the component where they haven't attended also. So it's both of those things together. You can't just do attendance, you can't just do, well, you can do just evaluative, that's the irregular F. But if it's both together, then you get the FW. And of course, it's, it's up to the faculty members on whether they want to use it or not. And the benefit of this is to you. Oh, uh, to me personally? No, to it's more work for the faculty, <laughs> but that's okay, because what it is, it's more useful for students. Uh, there's a couple benefits. First one is financial aid. So we can understand uh, if they have uh, the FW at a certain, given at a certain time, we, under, we start to see it impacts their financial aid because it shows that they're not going to class. And there's an attendance component to financial aid. Uh, not strictly attendance, of course, has to do with evaluation too. And then secondly, and more importantly in my mind, is counseling. If we see a student with a pattern of FWs, that shows that they're actually not participating in the college. That's different than a student who is not learning the material. They're very different. And so we can target our counseling resources more accurately, more effectively. Thank you. Yes. Sure. Yeah. The only related question I had is, will that, can, will that W be used in um, connection with, together with any other grade, like a, well, like a B? No, uh, it's, it's the, FW the FW is a unit. Okay. So you get an F or an FW. Fs are earned Fs, FWs are unofficial withdrawals. Oh, okay, I didn't know yeah. how that was going to show up. Yeah, it's not like a plus or minus. It's a good question because it could be like a plus or minus, but you can kind of stick it on other grades. It's well, actually I, a you unit. Know, I, I, when I was going to school, I, I knew a, very few people, but they do exist, that rarely go to classes and seems to, seem to get A's and B's. I don't know how they do that, Right. But because I couldn't. They're not in my But class. I didn't know. I was a bit maybe confused about how that was being applied. So it's just a total new category. It is an, it's not a new category. It's an F. Yeah. But it's an F, which is accompanied by a lack of attendance. It's another kind of F. Right. Okay. So, Dean, the, mm -hmm. when students enroll in a class, they, they have to drop it by that and drop deadline. Right. And so, if right. they don't show up since the first day, maybe students sometimes think that they're automatically going to get dropped? There, there's two drop deadlines. The first deadline is the, after the second week, mm -hmm. and there's a percentage mm -hmm. for half semester yeah. courses. And the, that deadline is uh, the no-show drop, and it's incumbent upon the faculty member to drop students at that point, because they've not shown up to class. Okay. Uh, after that, the students are supposed to drop themselves up to, I believe it's the ninth week, mm -hmm. the ninth week, mm -hmm. she, she teaching me well, thank you, <laughs> the ninth week of class, and uh, the students are supposed to drop themselves after that point. The faculty may drop them, mm -hmm. but it's completely optional. So what if they forget, like is there like a, on their pipeline can alert you, hey, you know, you're still enrolled, attend, like is there some way to just well, make it you, more, I don't know. To, if you go to class for two yeah. weeks and quit going, um, like so they remember odd. to go and officially drop their class so they don't get Oh, I see. Um, I don't think we have anything currently, do we? The grades first thing or? We're, we're, okay. Only to the students in the cohorts, like the, or all of them. So, that's all so they all would all get like a friendly yeah. reminder. Hey, remember to drop your class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all get um, notifications. Don't forget. Um, you need to drop your class. Mm -hmm. Deadline is so and so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's that. Um, it is optional for students. So you right. Can just because the first two weeks are so busy, you know, and it's yeah. like right. you know, yeah. they can just. And usually the faculty reminds students if you're they're in the class, you know. If you're here now, you have to be sure to drop if you're going to drop after the second week. And we usually tell people that, make sure that they do that. But it does slip through the cracks sometimes. And they can always petition. Okay. Thank you. Well, Thank you. See you next week. Yep. Not before. Good. Okay. Report uh, by Associated Students, Geneva.
Geneva Sherman. Are you busy this quarter? <laughs> <laughs> or this no. semester? <laughs> oh, good. You have minions that do things for you. Semester, so I'm oh, having chance to be going. So and you get to enjoy being the president. That's good. Yeah, Student Senate it's president. so wonderful. I love it. But <laughs> um, President Bloom, members of the board, and Dr. Gaskin, um, we've had only three meetings so far, so I don't have a ton to um, talk about. But there are a few significant things. Um, we do have March and March coming up this March 4th. And that's kind of um, where thousands and thousands and thousands of students come together at the Capitol and march for um, more spending for, or I guess, a, big, a, a bigger portion of the state budget to go towards education. So I think last year they clocked in around 20,000 students um, marching for higher education. So it's a wonderful thing. And um, we have a bus that's going, um, leaving here at 12 p.m. on Sunday night. Um, driving up there, we're going to be marching all day and then driving right back. Going to be here, um, back here at 12 p.m. on Monday. So it's going to be a whirlwind kind of wow. thing, but it's super fun and it really unifies the students who go and um, it's a really great experience and you do get some money to get food while you're there, so come please. And um, that'll be fun. We also have, I don't know if you... Um, know about the encore singing competition that happened last semester but um, our previous um, public relations officer on the student senate kind of set up this um, encore singing competition that ended up being really <coughs> successful and a lot of international students went and it was a it was a really cool thing to have here on campus and so this semester we are doing a dance competition, it's kind of like a So You Think You Can Dance. There's judges, there's the uh, prizes, so a, a bunch of different fun things. And so we're kind of get um, the word out to students about that. And um, I forget if I talked about this previously or not, but we are trying to do office hours for our student senate so that students who have questions or concerns can come and talk to us and they know that we're going to be there for them at certain times and um, they can always come to us with anything that they need to. So we're deciding if we want to do that inside our, student, our Senate room or if we want a table outside so that more students can see us and see who we are because a lot of people don't even know we exist. So trying to get our name out there. And um, we're also trying to do um, a Senate volunteer day. And we're thinking about doing Habitat for Humanity um, starting in March. I think it's March 23rd. We're going to be doing um, a Habitat for Humanity um, Student Senate Volunteer Day. So that'll be fun. And then we also have one of the um, bigger issues we're dealing with right now is MTD, which Dr. Gaskin came to present to our Student Senate. Um, they're proposing a 60% increase on um, the amount that they're charging for students to use the service. So they want, um, right now they're saying that it's costing around 76 cents per ride and they want to bring that number up to $1.25 per ride, which is actually more than the um, 10 pass little um, thing that they give out. It comes to $1.15 per ride, so they actually want to make it more expensive for the students, for students of Santa Barbara City College to ride the bus. And, and although it's an unfortunate um, circumstance, we're... They came to us early, which we really appreciate. The contract ends in 2014, so we're going to be um, talking about this a lot, talking to students, really getting the input we need to make a final decision. And um, I think that we'll be able to work with the MTD. They seem willing to work with us. So um, unfortunate circumstance, but we're working with it the best we can. And the last thing is the joint meeting that Dean had talked about. We're really excited for that and I can't wait to get to know all of you and I think that our students feel the same way. So thank you very much. Good. Thank you. You're very active for only having three meetings. That's really wonderful. Oh, Peter, could I, could Peter has a question. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. no, no, I want to commend you for, for leading the effort to get students to go to Sacramento. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not only is it a, it's a social event, I understand that part, <laughs> but it also gives students a chance to see that this is really our government. Mm -hmm. We we are the bosses, the folks who are elected. Mm -hmm. You know, they are they are helping hands, and and sometimes we forget that, and we come to see the people who are elected to positions of authority as uh, somehow 
inherently superior. And, they, and they're not. And they, they work for us and with us. And so you guys go up there and give them hell. <laughs> we will, thank you. And Doss Williams, who's now the chair of the higher education, um, is really willing to work with us. And he came to talk to our Senate. And he's been a great asset for us as well. So thank you very much. I think he's an alum. I don't know if he graduated. But yes. He, he, yes, yes, he attended here. Yeah, very good. Um, we have classified employees, Liz. Oh, she's already almost to the microphone. I was ready. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, good afternoon, President Blum and Dr. Gaskin, members of the board. Um, our consultation group is continuing to meet on a regular basis, and we look at what happens at CPC. A couple of things happen at CPC are good for classified. One is that um, because of Proposition 30 passing, the jobs that were in the 12-13 budget are now being starting to be filled. And the other is that there's going to be a committee set up to have a procedure for filling positions that are considered new. That means positions that were not in the 12-13 budget but may have been in the 11-12 or the 9-10 that are now out of the books can be looked at as far as also any new position. So that's a good thing. A couple of items on your agenda I want to address. One is the ATF report. The consultation group has reviewed it twice now. We had our two readings and we're in support of it. We acknowledge all the hard work that was done. I don't do that just because I worked on it, but all the team worked very hard and then the community has looked at it. So um, uh, we're appreciative that that is going forward. And the other is the, um, which is a really great thing for classified, is that the college is nominating a uh, California Community College Employee of the Year. And we're very supportive of Juan Patino's um, nomination by uh, by, by the school. And so I think it's great. He's a, a great groundsman, and it's great to see uh, employees recognized for all the hard work that they do. And the other thing I wanted to mention is yesterday we had a very good uh, presentation by the Santa Barbara SWAT team. Uh, members of the SWAT team came and addressed, uh, there were a lot of classified there, maybe some instructors, but there were staff there, and they presented a good program about keeping in mind that even though this is supposedly, you know, a nice community, safe community. You should always be aware of what's going on and have a plan in your mind so if something does happen, you won't go into a panic mode and not do anything or just freeze. And so it was, that was a very good presentation. And that's part of an ongoing, um, oh, I don't know, an ongoing uh, procedure or ongoing um, program that the college president has uh, started for us to look at the safety. As I, a student came by when I was, I was helping set up the technology and a student came by and wanted to know what was going on. He says, oh, he says, I'm afraid every time I go into class. He said, I said, well, you should come back because they will give you some ideas of what you can do so you don't have to be afraid every time you go into class because there are some things you can do and, they sh and, and the SWAT officers showed us uh, what you could actually do, you know. You can run, you can hide, or you can fight. And I think he got that point very well across to all the people that were there. So I think everybody's really appreciative that actually saw that. And he also kind of gave hints that the college is doing more stuff we may not even know about to enhance our, our security. So I think the college administration, especially Dr. Gaskin, because I know she's working hard, and Eric Fricke and Joe Sullivan and everybody that's involved in this kind of thing. Robert Morales is now has a lead role in that. So I want to thank all of them. So that's my report. Thank you. If you see me running with a with a fire extinguisher, yes. that was what they said I'm to grab installing one more fire extinguishers. Everybody we wants one Robert more. and I are fighting over ours. <laughs> <laughs> we all want fire extinguishers. You had to be there I think, but but they're good weapons. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. Well, it was a very good presentation, and thank you for inviting them. That was good. Okay, we have uh, from the superintendent president. Well, thank you very mm -hmm. much. Uh, there are just a, a handful of updates that I want to provide to you. I first of all want to acknowledge uh, Julie Hendricks and her team and uh, Joe Sullivan. We have been working mightily on facilities and the long-range development plan, which is really almost a facilities master plan. And Julie, on top of her normal workload has been doing a yeoman's job in pulling all of this together. It's not an easy task uh, organizing uh, the uh, architects and the consultants and uh, 
uh, my uh, eagerness, um, and I just really want to publicly acknowledge Joe and Julie, and particularly Julie. I wanted to comment on the students, uh, and Geneva is gone, but Ashley, if you could share with all of the student senate, they have stepped up to the plate relative to these negotiations with MTD, and frankly, it's not easy. Um, having gone to the MTD board myself and working with MTD in, prep in preparation for them coming to the students, uh, I just am incredibly impressed with how you're um, engaging with this very difficult situation. So kudos to you. None of us know where it's going to land other than we expect some sort of rate increase, and we're very concerned about that, clearly. I also wanted to comment on the SWAT presentation. It was very, very good. We have a great relationship with SPP, SBPD, and I really do owe Joe and Eric and Rob Morales uh, a great kudos for arranging that. This is ongoing in that we can never stop being ready and prepared. So this will just continue, and hopefully um, we will never, ever have to use it, just like insurance. Um, as far as um, something that, that Dean said uh, relative to some of the things that the Senate is uh, uh, ripping open, for example, the core principles. Your faculty and staff are doing incredible work on top of all of the um, uh, things that uh, we have had to deal with and contend with over the past several years to take a look at our core values, whether they be mission, whether they be board policies. Now we're embarking upon Edmaster planning. The Senate is looking at our core principles. That's heavy duty stuff. And uh, people are stepping up to the plate and not only doing the logistical operational parts, but doing the meaty underbelly, if you will, uh, and that's a positive, underbelly of the institution. So I just want to express my deep appreciation to the faculty and staff for being so open. You heard uh, Liz talk about CPC stepping up and doing some phenomenal work in areas that we heretofore haven't had the ability to do because we haven't had the resources. So this is an incredible period of time. And then I want to end on two notes. One is to remind you again about that uh, March 7th joint meeting with our Student Senate and our Academic Senate. And also on April 16th, we are planning a joint board meeting with the Carpinteria uh, Unified School District and the Santa Barbara Unified School District Boards of Education. April 16th, 5.30. Agenda is in process. Your representative is uh, President Bloom, and we have had some very engaging conversations with our counterparts at those two institutions. And then finally, uh, I just have this sense that um, SBCC is, is in for just some wonderful things, and uh, one of the first wonderful things is being able to go to Washington, D.C. for the Aspen uh, recognition ceremony. And because of that, I have asked uh, Jack, Kathy Malloy, and Laura Castro to accompany me. Um, Laura Castro is our articulation officer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Transfer center, no, articulation officer. And so I, I think it's really important. We're being recognized uh, for things that we do in transfer, things that we do in CTE, things that we do for our underrepresented populations, things that we do in counseling and student support, our dual enrollment, all of these things as a package are being so noted by um, Aspen. So I simply wanted to share with you, we'll be uh, doing that. And that is it. Great. That's good. I'll have a good trip, but it won't <laughs> be for a little while. But that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, board members, committees, um, fiscal committee? Who's we haven't met. We haven't, haven't met yet. You will. <laughs> um, facilities, same thing? Or did you meet? Not me. You haven't met yet. Okay. And you will on that one too. Ed policy, you we met that one met that time. And we've reported. Yeah. Okay. We're good. We're all eager and ready to go. Um, we go on to 1.8 quarterly report ending um, ending December 31st. Joe Sullivan. You know, I have to mention while he's coming up. There, there, we had over 430 pages of attachments on this, although a lot of it we had read before. Mm -hmm. But um, I told my husband, I just read a book this morning. I went over the whole thing. So uh, thanks to all the 
trustees for diligently reading everything, including this quarterly report? Well, I consolidated it down to just a few slides, about three minutes here, and, and we'll have the quarterly report then. So okay, um, I did put together just some key slides to talk about it. And primarily the slides that I, I'm going to be talking about, you'll see how they roll into then when we move on into the projection for year ends, so how we incorporated some of these items in there. But um, the first thing we wanted to look at is the general fund revenues. And if you look at where we're at, you can see that other state revenues have increased about 2.2 million. Um, it's important to note that this is from the financial aid media campaign. This is a campaign that we run through the chancellor's office. So basically we funnel um, revenues and expenses through. And for that, we get 5% of, of what they run through. So we do all their contracts for them. We do all their, in, we um, take in all the invoices from their consultants and their vendors and we pay them. And for that, we get 5%. And, and this year, we're going to get about 114000 for that. And that's a significant contribution that we've been able to get for doing it. Um, the state apportionment, you can see, is down on the current year to date. It's mostly down to the deferrals, collection of property tax shortfall from the redevelopment agencies. So some of that we expect to come back. And there's also, I didn't cite it here, but there's a shift. If you look down into the local revenues um, of the um, enrollment fee increases to $46. That simply transfers from apportionment to local because we collect it locally. Um, other in the local, you can see the international tuition has increased by 1.3 million and um, out of state by 374,000. And then the continuing yet enrollment fees, this is the conversion of the classes to fee based and this is what we've, we've collected year to date for that program. Yeah. Yes. I was just going to say, Joe, for, for folks who may not be familiar, could you briefly explain what deferrals and collection of property tax or second bullet means? Um, the deferrals are essentially, we get our apportionment from the state. Um, they tell us how much they're going to pay us. They're going to tell us how much they're going to pay us each month. And then they look at their cash flow and they say, we can't really give it all to you. So you recognize this amount of revenue, but we're going to pay you for it either later in the year or the following year. And um, our deferrals now with Prop 30 are going down from about 13 million this year down to 11. But the reality is because of the delay in the property tax collections from Prop 30, we're actually going up to almost 20 million in deferrals before we drop down in the following months, the coming months. So we will eventually get that money, but probably not until the beginning of next year? Um, it's to come to July. us. They're saying they'll get some of it to us in June and some in July based on the collections. They're, um, they're, they're working hard to get it to us because they know it, it's, it's really a burden for all of the education, you know, not just us, but K through 12 and, and, the college, and the universities and state colleges as well. Thank you. I just, some people are not familiar with how that system works. Okay. And then the redevelopment agencies, it's, it's where um, there's a program for funding um, local districts and um, providing funding for that. And what happened is um, part of the budget rolled those back last year. And um, as they um, ceased to exist, there was, supposed to, there was a projection of the revenues that would come um, to the other institutions and other districts. And um, it hasn't been as rapid as they thought it would be as far as being able to um, end those redevelopment agencies. And, uh, they're, and there are some of them, they're, they're not going to go as far as they have. But the governor um, in his budget now, I just read it again today, but it's actually he's um, proposing to backfill 100% of that at this point, which is a big step up from where it was 50%, and now he's taking it up to 100%. So um, hopefully we'll see that. Okay. So the funds that were allocated to the redevelopment agencies have been redeployed or aimed at education primarily. Yes. Is that right? And that. Well, they. Uh, it's, Yes. In other words, they collect the funds locally and then um, they're distributed locally rather than going through state apportionment. Is there any squabble with, with local agencies about who gets yes. what? There's, there's been um, a lot of meetings about that locally. And uh, I think in Santa Barbara, we were able to get through it much better than other counties. I mean, it was, um, it was much more amenable. I know some people felt that it was pretty contentious at times, but it was not nearly um, the, what it was in other areas. We've been able to get through it um, pretty quickly, actually. 
and our projections are actually in above what, what we had expected. So as a county, we're doing very well. It's just, it's the property tax mostly from the downtown business area. Um, it's the incremental tax, but it's, it's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So um, it should be good for us to get that, I don't know. <laughs> yes, so um, if we look at then the general fund year-to-date expenditures, um, you can see where academic salaries have decreased just slightly by 214000 um, If you look at classified salaries, they decreased actually 583000 This is due to vacancies held open and uh, the reductions in hourly personnel. Um, and you can see then employee benefits um, year-to-date have decreased by 711000 um, We won't see that large. There's some timing issues in there, so as the, the year goes on, that number will change, but um, year to date, it's down more than it will be at year in, just as far as we're projecting. Um, you can see that we're down in supplies and materials, and other operating expenses have increased, but again, that's due to the financial aid media campaign expenses. So as we get the revenues and the expenses, they flow through. It's a flow through issue. And another outgo, it looks like last year, we, what that is, is that's um, how quickly we transfer our funds out to the construction and equipment funds primarily. And last year we did it before December 31st. This year we haven't done yet. We've held the cash because of the deferral issue in the general fund. And so we'll move that over later in the year um, once we get the, the cash flow. You know, we see where the deferrals end up. But by the end of the year we'll make those transfers. But we have d delayed it at this point. Um, just real quick, in food service, you can see um, some very positive trends going up there, both in the budget and then in the year to date. Um, our expenditures are higher year to date than they have been in the past, and it's important to note that that was um, primarily through, we funded the remodel of the JSB Cafe, and that funding is, it was significant funding for us out of our program um, in food service, but it goes totally, the revenues from the JSB Cafe go into ed programs actually as part of the culinary arts budget. So even though we have the expense, we don't get to see the revenue, but it's something that, you know, as it is, that's what our enterprise programs do. They contribute to um, the benefit of the students on the campus if there's any uh, opportunity to do that. And food services has been generating um, a margin, good margin, so we're able to do that. Um, the Orpala Early Learning Center, we can see that it looks like um, we're way down in, in revenues. And the reason we're down in revenues is because we didn't transfer as much at the beginning of the year as we have in prior years. Um, we will be transferring 165000 into um, the Early Learning Center after January 1 rather than prior to it as we have in other years. The Campus Bookstore, and the reason this is up here is it's you can see the trend in revenues is down. And um, as we go forward, we know that this industry is changing. And um, they, we're starting to see it. There's um, some very positive things happening for the students in reducing the cost through the rental program that we were able to put in place, the book rental program, which now has 358 titles in it. Um, and there are e-books, which come through at a lower cost, um, lower, and so lower revenue. Um, we know that, um, you know, the, the good news is that um, as we've done it, we've been able to also keep our cost of goods and expenses down. Um, so we actually are positive um, 128,000 year to date, and um, we expect that to be positive at year end. But this is a trend, it's important to look. I mean, it's a pretty linear downward trend, and we do expect to see that given what we know is happening. Okay, that was just a quick rundown. If there's any other questions about it, I'd be glad to cover them. Thank you, and you, you provided this, I assume, the Chancellor's Office. Yes, the, the 311 Q is our standard reporting that we do to the Chancellor's Office. Right, but I couldn't read it on here. So yeah, I asked you. for extra I know. copies, you, that was pretty good. copies. Those never come through good. Though. good. I yeah, I apologize. We brought copies last time as well. We will get it. We'll get it right this time. <laughs> Next time, we'll hopefully have good, clean copies for you to read. More to read. Okay. Thank you very much. And budget, which is the other thing you're going to do there.
This is a, a three-way uh, presentation, so I'd like to begin, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Friedlander and then uh, Vice President Sullivan. Can I just ask, I just Please. remember, do we need to adopt the quarterly report? I've forgotten. Uh, let's see. Uh, no, it's just... uh, reports and information. Thank you. Yes. Okay. okay. Sorry. So what we're going to do today is give you a, a bit more of a sense on where we're landing with 1213 as we um, extend our projections through to June 30th of 2013, and then give you a sense and a flavor for where the 13-14 budget will be relative to um, the governor's proposed budget and how that might impact SBCC. So that's the plan for the next few minutes. And I wanted to uh, frame the discussion by sharing with you that this has been the first time in five years where we have not had workload reduction, and workload reduction is simply a fancy term for a forcible reduction in the number of students served through a reduction and, and a uh, restriction of, of course sections. So it's the first time in five years where we have not had a state-imposed workload reduction, nor do we have a state trigger mechanism that would cut us, cut our budget mid-year. And those are two really significant things. Oftentimes, people um, look at us and they say, gee, you're, you're not planning well. You, you can't project. It is impossible to project when you've got trigger mechanisms that midway through the year, if projected revenue, let's say tax revenue doesn't come in at a certain level, you're going to be cut several hundred million dollars. Or if a tax initiative doesn't pass, you'll be cut several hundred million dollars. So I think it's uh, kudos to all of you for taking a very conservative approach to our fiscal budget planning uh, to, in order to weather these uncertainties that have been prevalent and a part of our life for five <coughs> years. This is the first time again then in that long that we've had a balanced budget at the state level and we in turn have a structurally balanced budget here. And in fact, not only do we have a structurally balanced budget, but because of the conservative approach that you have taken, because of the cuts that we have made, quite painful as they have been, because of the ability that we have had to jumpstart our local revenue generation, there's very few ways that we can generate local revenue. But Joe and his staff have been phenomenal in doing so, particularly in facility rental and other areas. And because of Prop 30, all of those areas have contributed to the fact that we have unallocated revenue that we are projecting for 1314, and that's a rarity. I wanted to comment a little bit on Prop 30. What it did was it staved off further cuts. Those cuts would have been substantial on top of four years of additional cuts. But because of that now, because we built our budget on the basis that Prop 30 would not pass, we now have some discretion with some additional revenue. And that feels as if a weight has been lifted off the entire institution's shoulders because we have needs across this institution, which frankly Prop 30 is not going to meet. Prop 30 only restores about 25% of the money lost to the system. But nonetheless, we'll take any penny that we can get. So you have needs uh, across this institution in the areas of classified staffing, in faculty, in professional development, in equipment, in maintenance, in facility repair, in the Student Success Task Force mandates that we must implement, in counseling, in salaries and benefits, and the list can go on and on. So we're being very strategic and very deliberate. Part of this discretionary revenue, we have to peel off and um, uh, focus it on growth in order to earn that discretionary revenue. So that'll be a very important element, as Jack will be sharing with you in a few moments. The final thing that I wanted to frame the discussion with has to do with three interesting aspects of the governor's proposed budget for 1314. Those three elements include a proposal to have a 90 unit cap on students' ability to take courses that are state subsidized. So typically it takes 60 units to earn an associate's degree, so that's 50% more. And with few exemptions, the state is saying we need to move these students through to goal attainment and allow those behind those students to get access to higher ed. 
So it's a real efficiency factor as well as a focus factor for students. So we'll see what happens with that 90 unit limit. We certainly saw that playing out in enrollment priority for students who are lower than 100 units. They get um, a higher priority than over 100. So the legislature is telling us something about that. The second element is that um, this has come back around repeatedly over the last several years. The transition from apportionment, funding based upon enrollment, to funding based upon completion. Right now the snapshot for our enrollment and our funding is done at the 20% time frame. So about the third Monday of the semester, we take a snapshot and we submit that data to the state and we're paid on the basis of enrollment. But what the state has been very interested in for several years, and there has been an outcry against this, but it's becoming clearer and clearer we're moving toward that, is completion-based funding. So we would be funded on um, uh, success, retention, and the like. The money wouldn't necessarily be taken away from us uh, based upon that difference, but rather it would be redeployed into student support services intervention. So we'll see how that unfolds. It's projected to be a five-year phase-in. And then finally, adult education. The governor's budget proposes to transition all of adult ed to community colleges rather than um, uh, having local decision between the school districts and the community colleges here. It's always been at SBCC. And to also um, focus state subsidized course offerings and non-credit to about five core functions that the, the, the governor calls core functions, ESL, citizenship, uh, basic skills, adult high school, and vocational. And that anything outside the core would um, uh, the student would have to pay the full cost of instruction, which is estimated to be about at the non-resident rate. So those are the three elements that we're watching very carefully in the 13-14 budget that will frame Joe's presentation and Jack's. So I'd like to turn it over to Jack. Thank you, Laurie. This is um, just a snapshot of, where, snapshot of where we are this spring. And as um, Laurie reported earlier, um, we planned on, um, we had two scenarios, one scenario that Prop 30 would pass and one that it wouldn't pass. <coughs> we did that by having sections that were on standby. So when it passed, we opened up those sections, um, but it was late in the day um, by the time we were able to do so. So what the, um, where we are overall in terms of the unit count is we're up about, this, this at the end of the semester would be about 4%. We grew this spring compared to last spring. Um, with respect to California resident FTS, um, we're up about 1.83% headcount, flattened, flattened headcount. Um, but in terms of unit count, that would be about 2% when everything is, you know, at the end of the term uh, on that. Um, we had large growth in um, out of state, you know, mainly international students that accounted for um, the difference between um, overall enrollment um, unit count and in-state, uh, you know, total units on that. The um, next slide is our FTS projections. Here, if you look at our California resident, um, before we knew that the governor was going to include in his budget, which we didn't really find out until January and still uncertain, money for growth for this year, um, the credit resident FTS, we were up um, over what we projected um, and needed, uh, 270 FTS or 2.12 percent. So credit was right where we wanted it to be. Um, and that's prior to us finding out in January the governor actually had in his budget um, some you know, growth money. In non-credit enhanced, we were down 24 FTS compared to what we uh, had projected. And that's because of a continued decline in um, non-credit ESL students and um, you know, withdrawing from the you know, Santa Barbara, you know, Ventura Jail um, you know, in, in that area, uh, accounted for that. The non-credit, in non-enhanced, we're down 521 FTS, and that was because of the conversion 
that we did from um, state support to fee-based. So um, bottom line is um, we were down 178 FTS or 1.28 percent. But then we found out in January we think we're going to get um, equivalent to $600,000 more for growth for this year, which is 131 FTS. So if you take the 178 FTS that were short um, prior to that, plus the 131 FTS now we find out we can grow um, this year after the fact. Uh, uh, we're entering, um, we'll end the year um, 309 FTS short of our funding cap or 2.2 percent um, down. And so that's where we are there. The next slide is our projections. So here for this year, this is the 309 I just talked about that will end this year, you know, short. And we have three years, as Dr. Gaskin said, to um, fully recover before we get penalized. So what we plan to do um, is borrow against um, this summer's FTS and count it towards um, this past year. Um, and that way we can, you know, meet our FTS target, but then we have to pay that back. So we'll get full funding this year um, and not be on recovery, but then we have to pay that FTS back if we borrowed against summer. Um, what we're assuming now is that in each of the next three years, the state will say we can grow by 2%. We don't know that, but that's our projections on that. And here, we're assuming that um, in 2013-14, we can convert all non-enhanced you know, personal enrichment classes, except for the um, parent-child workshops, to um, fee-based. So we only plan to generate 110 FTS um, from um, non-enhanced courses over this time period. Um, so in order to make up the loss of, you know, converting plus the growth of 2 percent plus pay back the summer FDS over a couple of years, um, we're going to have to grow um, 4 percent next year or um, it translates to 574 FTS or 991 sections. You know, 191. 191. 991 no. sections. And what a section is? 191. Thank God. Um, 191. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was saying that and I was starting to panic. So I, uh, that's why I didn't hear you the first time. I was uh, in utter, utter shock. Uh, um, you know, there's certain things we can pull off, and We're that's not to, one of them. We're here to help. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you. You just lightened my attention. load. You know what? You, you lightened my load considerably. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Hey, yeah, well, piece of cake now. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> so in 2014-15, um, we would, um, um, you know, start paying back part of that summer FTS. We have to grow three percent. Um, you know, to make up the 2% growth plus pay back the summer. And that's another additional 380 FTS, or another 127 uh, sections. And here's the figures for 15, 16. Um, we have to grow another 3%, and this is what it would uh, equal. Um, so that's a large amount of FTS we have to grow. So the question is how are we going to do it? Um, we're going to do it through a combination of the factors. One, um, we started the discussions yesterday with the Senate on going to two summer sessions, beginning um, in summer 14, um, which would help. And plus, the students want that. They want year-round uh, courses. One summer would be session would start right after the spring semester ended. It would be very good for our continuing students. Um, the second summer session would correspond to when the high school students um, are available. after, And they... Um, comprise a significant portion of our summer session enrollments now, so they still have that opportunity um, as well um, on that. Second is, is um, this integration we're doing with um, in integrating non-credit into credit. Already the deans um, are working on a, great, a number of great ideas and strategies where we firmly believe we're going to increase um, you know, by 14, 15, certainly 15, 16, um, the number of students who transition in from basic skills, GED, 
of non, uh, high school you know, uh, programs and ESL, non-credit into credit. Um, and we're, that's one of the major benefits that will come out of this integration um, you know, on that. The third is I believe the biggest jump will be um, in all the immigration reform proposals, which I'm sure something will pass this year, um, where there's term, total commonality is in order to be on the path to citizenship, you have to take, um, show proficiency in English. So our English um, ESL enrollments, both in non-credit and credit, I predict will go um, up substantially um, you know, in that area. The next area, a major one, is um, the um, retention and persistence through all our student success efforts, our transfer efforts, ESP, and different programs we'll be bringing forward um, that we're designing now. And that's where it's the most efficient way to increase FTS. And also, as uh, Dr. Gaskin said, our funding in the future is going to be based on how many students get degree certificates um, and transfer. So um, we're highly motivated to do this. Um, they'll increase our FTS, um, but also um, they'll increase our funding or allow us to have much more flexibility in our funding you know, going forward. Plus, it's the right thing to do um, in that area. And the last area, um, there's many ideas, but I won't go into detail, is um, the um, new program development. And the one I'm most excited about is, I think it's a huge crisis we have in people 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s who need to work um, and need to find jobs and get skill sets in a hurry. Um, so if people get laid off or um, retire and they realize they, can't, they, have no, they don't have adequate pension plans, what do they do next? And so one of the major initiatives we'll be doing is developing um, a different kind of curriculum and counseling and career kind of counseling for that large group of people, especially in our community, who um, can't afford um, to not be working um, at a livable wage. Plus, a lot of people who are retired who want to be engaged but need a skill set to be, you know, to work for nonprofits and do things, they, they need a skill set. Um, what's that going to be? Um, so this will be designed to help them as well. So with that, um, that's where we are um, on it. And if I could just make one uh -huh. comment. Um, this is assuming 2% growth each year for three right. years. Oh, thank you. And uh, this figure is not unreasonable. This was, as I said, our high water mark in 0910. So it's just climbing back up to where we were and then had to forcibly come down to the workload reduction. Right. Okay. Um, Craig, yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, um, the budget, we've increased, you're projecting these uh, additional uh, uh, sections. The cost of those, uh, am I correct in assuming that it's mostly faculty to, okay, to teach the classes and we've budgeted for that faculty or we are, well, that we'll additional that, new faculty we're going to need? Yeah, for example, um, what this shows here, Craig and everybody, is, um, you know, this 309 FTS that we're short, you know, which mm -hmm. we'll capture, that alone is like 1.4 million. Right. And so if you, you know, if you go to the 2% increase each year, um, it's substantial. So part of that growth money would be used to pay for classes and fac you know, faculty to teach and counselors for those classes. So that's where that growth money would come through. The second thing that happens is the state tells us every year um, how many full-time faculty we have to have. And so we are expect, fully expect um, by in, in 14, 15, you know, a year from this fall, um, to have to, you know, we'll be having to, having to hire a lot of new faculty members and counselors are, are considered faculty. Um, and so, you know, they'll be hired, but they'll be also teaching those growth classes as well um, on that. So that, but yeah, so it comes out of the growth funding is where the money comes from. Yeah, but then in follow up on that, I've been, like the others, I've been inundated with reading much of which I'd already read. Um, and questions and uh, some HR things are going to come before us uh, later to this meeting, I think. We, we have like, um, from what I could tell, like counseling, uh, student counseling, student services. And I don't, I understand that we're going to have increased needs, but we have to maybe apply that differently. Yes. Is there an area where I, where I see this in this budget or it doesn't it really show because it's just Not, a wash and right and this isn't really a budget this is a forecast a for, for our I'm enrollment mm -hmm. and this is preparatory for you will be adopting a tentative budget before june 30th of 2013. so this is actually the launch of our budget development cycle for 1314. 
and the um, underpinnings for our budget is always our FTES and what our goal is, and that then creates the, the revenue that we can run the college. So this is the beginning, and these are the assumptions that we're making. Well, you know, I'm new at this, so sure, absolutely. I, yeah, there's a lot of stuff to comprehend, and when, oh, yeah. you know, a few days ago I was told I get to read 438 pages <laughs> for this meeting, and uh, luckily I had already read most of it, yeah. but still, you have to go through it and make sure you're fresh, and there's nothing that's totally 100% crystal clear, maybe, and you go over it <coughs> and over it until you think you can grasp it all. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. You know what, you know, we give assessment tests, and one of the assessment tests we test is our reading. Reading? Uh, we, should, we should just give them this agenda. I, I, when I first, first came to the attachments, right? That, that should be the test, right? Right. See, when I first came to City College, I had to take some dumbbell courses. I think one of them was dumbbell reading. They called it uh, less, than, less than English, 1A or English, dumbbell English, and they also <coughs> made me take dumbbell math. Right. You know, so, but I passed all that, and I went on. Thank you. But I, don't think, it, I don't think it was really presented as such. <laughs> you won't find it in the catalog right. under that. No. Anyway. Okay, thank you. And, and am I right? We're, we're talking about a growth now, um, but I don't hear any concerns about space. Um, we, we've had we're, some we're looking past. at all options. As Jack has indicated, um, second session of summer, he'll right. be working through participatory help. governance on that. We're also looking at uh, our online courses. We're also, our, our campus has three distinct parts to it and so we're looking at fully utilizing our yeah. campuses and the friday friday classes aren't as you know it's a misperception that we don't have friday classes okay. we do have friday classes um and our labs are are jammed um as well as and other friday. course offerings okay. but um it's it's not just it, it's not just friday that's going to solve the problem um so we're looking at all opportunities i'll tell the people at lazy acres because they stop me in the aisle to tell me there's no problem. <laughs> it's like a ghost town around here on Friday. Yeah. And I thought, Compared oh, to Monday through Thursday. You probably, know. but still. They give us a yes. on Thursday. No, well, that's right. They're all studying on Friday. That's right. No, no, the Starbucks is full of people studying. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Marsha? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think we have to do all of the things that Lori just described, right. but, but also a reminder that we are saying we're just getting back to where we were in 910. Yeah. So the facility issue. That's was right. the same in good 910. Yeah. yeah, good point. Thank you. Oh, you're okay. back? You're not Jack? Yes. I'd just like yeah. to respond to Craig with, you sound like exactly the kind of student that needed SBCC. <laughs> <laughs> and, and look at how good uh, he is I hope now. that was a compliment. And it it was a compliment yeah, yeah. to SBCC and to you. <laughs> okay. Well, good, because I started back at SBCC, too, so I think it was a great place to come. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to talk real quickly about the trends from 2010-11 to 2012-13 and the adjusted budget that we're going to... So, and we're using our adjusted budget as a projection, more or less, for year-end. And I thought it was important to go back to 10-11 just to show what has happened since that point in time um, and to show how we're going to try and adjust it going forward. And then at the end, we'll do just a very quick look at the uh, um, governor's budget for next year and what it pretends for us as far as revenues goes. Um, some of it we've already talked about. And um, the most important thing to, to note in the adjusted budget was the passage of Prop 30. So if we look at it, and I'm going to talk back here. <laughs> I get an echo when I'm up there. Um, can everybody hear me still? Um, when you look at the unrestricted general fund revenues, you can see where we were. Oh, I did that, didn't I? Okay, there we are. They, it doesn't really just go away. <laughs> um, the, we're at almost 90 million in 10 11. Um, and then as we look, we came down in 11 12. Our adopted budget, of course, did not have Prop 30 in it, so you expect that to be considerably lower. And then you see where we are, and our adjusted budget is 88.9 million. Again, almost 89 million. So um, when you look at that, um, what's important to note here is that back in 2010-11, if you look at our local revenue, it was 12.2 million. If you look at it currently, it's 16.4 million. So um, as the general apportionment dropped from almost 75 million down to about 70 million, we, may, we compensated for that in our local revenue. And that's what Dr. Gaston was talking about earlier. That's our international, our out-of-state, 
the community services revenue, which we've ramped up to almost a million dollars, and, and um, you know, other things that we've been able to do. And just to emphasize that a little bit, I, I have this slide which shows it as a percentage, and you can see that so the local revenue went from 13.6% to 18.5% of our total revenue, while um, in 10-11, the, the general portion was 83.3, and now it's 78.3, and so it dropped 5%. In that same time period, um, our expenditures have gone from about 81.8 million to 82.3 million now, um, looking at our adjusted budget. Um, you can see that salaries have decreased about 2.1 million, primarily in support services in short term. Um, benefits have increased 1.1 million through increases in the health and welfare allowance, worker, workers' comp, unemployment insurance, and first contributions. Um, and it, this would have been, it was, it was offset by the reduction in staffing. So our increases were significant. Um, some of those we negotiated, the health and welfare allowance was negotiated the last two years. Um, we've been able to cover the increase in health and welfare allowance for our staff, which has been very important. And, uh, but that's been um, also, we've had significant increases in workers' comp, unemployment, and PERS as well. And we're looking, um, this year, um, we just got our workers' comp rate just the other day, and it's much lower. So we'll see a benefit from that going forward to 13-14. So we're excited about that. Um, supplies and materials and other operating expenses are, are budgeted pretty close to what they were last year. Um, one way that we've been able to bring our, our budget into alignment is we reduced our transfers out to um, our other funds, construction and, and the equipment funds. And so if you look at it, we took eight and a half million in transfers in 10-11. And in our adopted budget, we were just under four million and we're just about the same number now. So what's the turnaround from Prop 30? Um, you can see it, um, it's significant. Um, we're going from in 11-12 essentially a four and a half million dollar loss to about 2.6 million in the adjusted budget and positive margin. If we look at our ending fund balance, we, um, we can see that it was about 39.3, we're projecting 40.6 million. Um, the difference there when we looked at the 2.6 million is that we're projecting to, uh, to spend in our construction and equipment funds about a million 250,000 more than we transferred over. Um, we, were, we felt that there was a real pent up demand in those areas because for the last five years we've been decreasing our expenditures in those areas. And those are essentially the, the Day-to-day -day maintenance of the campus is covered in that and some construction projects. Um, and then our technology equipment purchases and, and other equipment just to keep the, the campus going. Um, so just a quick comparison, just 11-12 to 12-13 to kind of emphasize some points. Um, you look at the revenue because of the passage of Prop 30 goes from 85.8 up to almost 89 million. The expense comparison, um, we've actually, we're actually looking at probably reducing our overall expenses at, by the, at the end of the year by almost 1.4 million. And again, we reduced the transfers out even from 11-12 to 12-13 by um, $2.6 million. So, and and I, just because I like blue, I want to slow show this slide again. It's, it's such a, a, a significant, you know, what we've done. And um, to emphasize what um, Dr. Gaskin had said earlier, it's that um, we were able to do that not because we just reduced expenses, but that we did increase international and out-of-state, that we did increase community services. And there are other areas, too, where we looked at we, where we increased our enterprise fund revenues. And, and that's just been, that's kept us flat where, in, in other colleges, they haven't had the ability to do that or the benefit of that, and I think that's just really helped us. So if we look at it, there's even some other possible adjustments that we'll see to, towards year end, between now and year end, and um, I wanted to make sure I brought those out so that um, people were aware of them. 
um, there will be an adjustment for the actual collection from the redevelopment grants. As I said, um, the latest that we're getting is that the backfill is going to be actually 100% of those redevelopment grants, which um, we actually have an allowance um, right now in our revenue projections of a million dollars that we assume we were not going to get, not just from that, but from other um, mid-year adjustments. So as we look towards year end, we could see a significant positive adjustment from those backfill on the redevelopment agency grants and, and other things. Um, there's open positions. We have that one-time expense re reductions for the positions held open. And you saw that in the quarterly report. When you looked at it, you saw the, the reduction in um, classified staffing. And that's specifically because uh, there were open, the, it's the hourly, but a, a good portion of that was open positions. And we haven't quantified that through year end. Um, but that will show up when we, when we put out our year-end numbers. That will, all that will be fully included. So there will be a little bit more of a positive adjustment there. So we can see you know, that um, through the revenue increases and the expense reductions, we, we've managed our budget well this year. And I have to apologize for what's going to happen next. I was told to take it out. Mm -hmm. Oh, it didn't do it. My drum roll is gone. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I know. Lori's happy about it. Um, this is just really quick, the 13-14 um, um, state budget. Um, if we look at where the changes are coming um, to community colleges, um, we can see that they're shifting the adult education um, from K-12 to community colleges across the, the state. Um, the truth is in our district that we already have that. So. Um, I don't know if we'll see any of that transfer of funds. For, or actually, they increased um, the community college by $300 million. Um, I don't know how that's going to be distributed or if we'll see any of that, but that is something that's coming to all community colleges. Um, there's a deferral buy-down of $179 million, which would, as I said, would reduce our deferrals from over $13 million to around $11 million. Um, Support for the energy projects, Prop 39. This is really nice because it um, puts 49 and a half million into the budget next year, um, but it's specifically allocated to um, energy conservation projects or um, photovoltaic projects, lighting projects. And so, um, right now, the proposal in the governor's budget was to distribute it by FTES, which means we would get 600,000. The legislative analyst's office and, and some districts are coming out saying that they believe that it should be distributed to projects that are already in the pipeline that are for energy conservation. And so um, they, they actually put a call out this week for projects. The chancellor's office did that any, any district that has a project that they've already got in the pipeline that would fit this um, to apply for it. And fortunately, we actually have a project like that. Um, so we're going to be putting that in next week. What's the dollar value of that project? I don't know because I haven't looked at it in a while, but it was to put photovoltaic on the bottom lots um, right. around the stadium and uh, you know across from the beach, those lots, and in the top lot here running out to the top of the stadium. Good. And so um, that's, uh, we had the firm Compass Energy put that proposal together for us, so we're going to get to them and get them to reactivate it. Like the ones on the West Campus. I Just like West Campus. Use Good. Of course, that will have to go through the Coastal Commission, so <laughs> we'll have to see if we can get it. I say like the sun, yeah. yeah. Um, Solar energy. If we look at the 2013-14 state budget and the unrestricted general fund, this is where we saw the, the benefit in that we didn't get the hit to revenues that we would have had if it didn't pass, $197 million. Um, what they were looking at when the governor's budget came out was they projected that COLA would be about 1.65 percent for the year. Now, I don't know if they're going to revise that projection. I'm sure by the May revise that may change. But if it does, that left um, about 2.19 percent for growth, which is kind of what Jack was talking about. If we, if we project out using this, that might be the allocation, but probably not. It's going through negotiations. so. We'll have to see how it comes out. Okay. Um, so the reasons for optimism, we, we Prop 30 did pass, Prop 39 passed, um, but I think the most, um, the, 
the reason I feel most optimistic about the next couple of years is that we do have a balanced state budget. And even though as everyone keeps, I keep getting these reports, it's very unique how they balance the budget. They did balance it, and um, even the legislative, legislative analyst's office believes that they can balance their budget next year and the following year. So that's, that's very positive news for the state of California. Okay. And that's all I'm going to do on this. Okay. okay, any questions or anything? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That's good. Okay. Um, accountability reporting for community colleges. Yes, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, to you again uh, Robert Else, who will be sharing with you the annual report of our uh, ARC measurements, which are dashboard uh, metrics. Hello again. I want to point out before I get too far into this that Melanie Rogers, whom I introduced and congratulated earlier, and unfortunately she's no longer here. The data that you're seeing is Melanie's data. So her work really uh, has helped us to shine. Uh, Alan, do you think you can, I, I should have brought these on PowerPoint, I apologize. Alan's gonna uh, do his best to get, up a, get, us, get them up on the screen, but you have them in your, uh, in your handouts. These measures are collected from every community college in the state, all, all 112 of us, and are published annually on the Chancellor's Office website, and it's a great opportunity for colleges to see how they're doing both uh, by themselves and compared to their peers and compared to the rest of the state. And uh, as you can see, in, in all of these measures, Santa Barbara City College uh, is doing extremely well, always above average, many times uh, up there with, the, with our peers, in the high, the high peers, and that's uh, due to the leadership of Jack Friedlander and the hard work of our, of our faculty and, and everybody here at the college. We look very, very good. Aspen Institute looks at this. I'm sure that was a factor. Um, why don't we take a look at these just quickly one by one. They're explained in your handouts. I won't go into great detail. This first one, we call it the SPAR, Student Progress and Achievement Rate. These are uh, full-time, first-time students. Um, they're tracked uh, for six years to see if they got a degree, did they transfer to a four-year college, did they get a certificate of 18 or more units, uh, did they become transfer directed or transfer prepared, meaning they took math and college level math and English, maintained a certain GPA. As you can see, we are well above the state uh, average. Uh, we're almost up there with the peer group high. Peer groups. The Chancellor's Office uh, takes all the data from all 112 colleges and applies sophisticated algorithms to, to group us into like peer groups of colleges based on our population, demographics, curriculum, all kinds of factors. And uh, in this particular measure, uh, there are 18 of us in this peer group. Moore Park happens to be the peer group high, our neighbor, but as you can see, uh, you know, we, we're, we're very proud of this rate. Any questions about this particular one? Okay, Let's, Alan, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, these are students who earned at least uh, 30 units. Again, first time students. It's actually the same cohort as the, the previous slide. And again, uh, we, we look very good here. Earned at least 30 units within six years. Uh, next. Persistence rate, uh, these are uh, students who uh, returned and enrolled, enrolled in one fall and then returned and enrolled in the subsequent fall. And uh, a slight, you know, a couple slight dips here, we believe a uh, couple possible factors are international students that come, stay here for a year and then go back to their home country. Also, economic pressures for students to leave their studies get a job or return to their previous job, many factors at work here. But again, uh, uh, we look good. Our, we know our own, our own fall to spring persistence rate, students who enroll in the fall and stick around for the spring, that's in the high 80%. So we do very well there. Next. Success rate for vocational courses. Uh, we, uh, we are the peer group high in this metric in this year. 
Uh, and that's amongst 40 colleges. That peer group has 40 colleges in it. So again, a big success here, and uh, we're proud of that. Uh, next. Success rate for basic skills courses, again, uh, steadily rising. We reached a new high in this report year. The peer group high here was Pasadena. So we're right up there with Pasadena. And that's amongst 13 colleges. Next. Improvement rate for basic skills courses. These are English and math students who assessed into uh, an English or math course that was two or, more two or more levels below college, but then within three years, they made it to a higher level or made it all the way to college level. Next. And this is the same rate that I just talked about, it except it's for, its, it's for strictly ESL courses. The previous one was English and math. This is ESL. This, uh, we are concerned about and we uh, uh, realize this has been flat and in fact dropping a little bit and uh, Jack and I discussed it and uh, Jack, I don't know if you want to say anything about it or should I, you know. We can try and respond. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. I won't mention the 991 sections that we. <laughs> um, the uh, ESL faculty has been uh, Con conducting workshops and looking at other innovative um, techniques from Laney colleges and others, Laney College and others that have been uh, successful, and we're looking at curriculum changes and ways to ways to improve this rate. Anything you want to add, Jack or Priscilla or yeah. anybody? We get some active skills. We just had a big a workshop um, with the faculty all attended this past Friday um, with students from Laney College. We're looking at. Um, Making changes in how they uh, structure the curriculum, looking at acceleration models, but just um, making a commitment to uh, rethinking the curriculum to increase the uh, student success rates. That not only getting through the ESL um, sequence, but also successful transitioning into college-level reading, writing, and math um, or career tech programs, and completing those. So I, I'm feeling very optimistic, and I really appreciate the faculty coming forward and. Uh, embracing uh, the need to uh, you know, take a fresh look at their curriculum. Who's the population for these ESL courses? Because this is for credit, so this is not the ESL that's offered in the community at our local elementary schools. So Correct. who's the population for this ESL? It's um, uh, those second language learners who have immigrated here, um, students who have progressed from the non-credit to credit ESL, as well as our uh, international students. It's an um, uh, eclectic group. So what percentage of these are international students doing now? Mm. Out of? Out of how many? Uh, probably around 1,000 now. Oh, 20%. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any other questions or comments? Mm -hmm. the, the purpose of, of bringing this information forward is to make sure that the board and, and the community is aware of, uh, of highs and lows and, and how well we're doing. And the Student Success Task Force is modifying this slightly uh, so you'll see a slightly different and improved scorecard uh, next year when this comes out. Right. Okay. No, I appreciate the numbers. It just, it, it's good to see how we're doing. So I'm glad the legislature made us do it. <laughs> Thank you. Else? Okay. Thank you, Ellen. Sure. Thanks. Nice job, Robert. <laughs> you didn't mess up on the numbers. Um, item for future consideration? No? We, we're doing a lot today, so maybe we don't have to think of something new. Uh, 3.1, Special Report Crediting Commission. Well, we is, have seen this before. This is a very important um, yeah. action that I am requesting of you, and that's a recommendation to approve the Special Report to the Accrediting Commission for Community and Junior Colleges um, in response to our warning placement. And you have seen this. This is second reading. We'll certainly mm -hmm. entertain any questions. Okay. And now we have the um, the result of the poll. Yes. The, yes. New poll the too, second so. survey, which shows right. um, survey. Um, uh, throughout the spectrum of the, the um, uh, 
questions increase in statements of agreement yeah. uh, with um, uh, it basically then an improvement between fall and uh, spring. Sure. Okay. Oh, yes, Peter. I move approval. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Second. Marianne. Okay, any more discussion? Any discussion? We've seen this before. It's painful, but we, I'm glad we're doing it. We just have to finish it off. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, good, thank you. And we'll send that off in March. Yes. Four weeks, okay. Yes. On time. Now that, we've, <laughs> now that we've voted for it, I would like to just add that. Um, sure. I'd like to see this kind of poll taken, you know, on a kind of a regular basis. Give people a chance to feel like they have more than one avenue in order to make a statement or be involved and since we're all about being transparent the more avenues that we provide the better I, it may be hard to do that and keep it really meaningful and timely but still it's it's uh, really great information as a trustee thank you thank you okay. yes lisa please. sure I, I just wanted to take a minute to thank the task force members yeah, and thank you I'd love to name you all by name, um, Dr. Gaskin, maybe you want to do that, but honestly, to members of the public, this has been a thorough and a grueling course of action to, to deal with the accreditations um, report and um, their, their warning. And um, just, I can't thank the staff enough, staff and faculty and board members for participating in this and getting it all wrapped up and ready to go on time. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for doing that. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. We have uh, classified employee of the year. And we're all tickled. I am <laughs> really proud um, to be able to do this. This is something that I fervently believe in, and that is recognizing our staff and faculty with uh, prestigious honors like this because they are so deserving. Okay. This is one that um, I am committed to every year, and uh, it is my pleasure to recommend Juan Patino to you uh, for nomination as Classified Employee of the Year to the California Community College Chancellor's Office for consideration. He is um, one of our grounds uh, employees, and he, uh, to a, um, a, a person, greets everyone with uh, such a great deal of warmth and makes our grounds shine in support of teaching and learning. He really, truly, um, he, he exemplifies the spirit of SPCC, that, it, um, that excellence in teaching and learning starts the first time a student steps onto campus. That's great. Do we need to, yes we do. Okay, we need to nominate him for this. Do I have a motion? So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? Juan's the one person I know on the grounds because he is so friendly. He's wonderful. He just, it's, it's, uh, I think he's enjoying his work, so that's good. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. This is good. We'll hope for him at the state level. Huh? Education master plan. Dr. Gaskin. This is a, another tribute, uh, as I mentioned, to the institution to take on something as um, fundamental, as important as the Edmaster Plan. So before you is a recommendation from me to embark upon the core of our planning and integrated planning process, which is our, our Edmaster Plan, something required by Education Code. And there's an oversight that one of the trustees pointed out, and I want to apologize that we need to include a um, meeting with the trustees uh, for initial uh, data ga gathering as the consultant meets with all of the other constituent groups. So I apologize for that. That will be added. Okay. Good. Any discussion or any questions about this? Okay. I, it's good. I had assumed we had one, so I was <coughs> kind of uh, surprised, but I'm glad we're embarking on it and have enough time to do it when it, everything else going. So thank you. As a point of uh, discussion, but not really, I just a comment. When I when this when I first got the memo on this and looked at it, and I and then all the acronyms are new to me, and and they said EMP, and I <laughs> thought it was like a magnetic pulse, something or other. Anyway, I figured out what they were talking about, and uh, and read it, and then I thought, you know, we have all these other plans, and we have the, the um, uh, you want to say CPC, 
we have these other organizations that plan all this stuff, and we have all these programs in the works and in development, some being completed. And so I felt like this is redundant. We are, we're already doing all of this. But um, thanks to um, our president, I was persuaded to really take, take a look at it from a different point of view. And I think it's, if, if we do this, and we are going to do it, I believe, but it, by doing this, then our planning becomes more uniform with the other schools and uh, the people we're judged against and ranked against. And, and um, we certainly don't need any more bad or evil eyes on us. I think this institution is doing really, really well at this point as far as healing and coming together. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, do we need to take a break? It looks like we should the other need to act on this. Yeah, we do need to vote on this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, we have a motion and a second. I'll move, move to um, approve second. the uh, contract is, is what you're asking for, correct? That's what, yeah, for the education master plan. For the educational okay. master plan. There's a second? Second. Okay. Any more discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. We don't, you know, I don't, we can finish this. It looks like it, it's finishable. I, think we, I, I was think wondering for a little while. Yeah. yeah. If there's such a word. Yeah. Um, so, or do you want to take a quick break? Everybody okay? Okay, let's go on ahead. This is good. Uh, we have a, a gutsy board here. <laughs> Pat English, Human Resources. Good evening, President Bloom, members of the board, President Gaskin. I have learned that February is a very important month when it comes to human resources. This isn't my first February here, but it's my first February here. So um, there are a number of items in front of you for your consideration tonight. The first item is uh, resolution number 31, which involves the layoff of a classified manager. As you are aware, there's significant restructuring ahead for continuing education. And part of that restructuring involves a lack of work for the position of director registration and technology. So this resolution that is in front of you represents the elimination of that position and the layoff of the current incumbent. Okay. <coughs> Any questions? And I need a motion and then we'll have a, I remembered, a uh, roll call vote. Can we have a motion? Uh, nobody wants to move no. to eliminate a position, I understand. Mm -hmm. yes. I so move. Okay. I'll second it. Okay. Okay, roll call. Oh, I didn't know I was allowed to vote. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> yes. <No. laughs> Sorry. You can abstain Good. if you want. Oh, yeah. I would like to abstain actually. Yeah, this Thank is a little you. hard for you, I understand. <laughs> yes. Trustee Bloom? Aye. Trustee Aye. Trustee Aye. 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 Okay. And non-renewal of administrator's contracts. Which is the next resolution. It is uh, a result of the, that restructuring also. And because these are educational administrators, it's the non-renewal of their contracts. This involves um, one dean position and three director positions at continuing education. Okay. I move approval. Okay. Is there a second? Second. I'll second it. All the, uh, oh, we need to do a roll call. Um, but these are the positions. Th there will be some hiring under the Center for Lifelong Learning. That is correct. So these positions, the people who are in these positions might want to <coughs> apply or not. It's up to them. I just that wanted is to make also that clear. Correct. Okay. Okay. Can we have a roll call vote? Trustee Peter? Abstain. Trustee Bloom? Aye. Trustee Cronenberg? Aye. Aye. Trustee Haslund? Aye. Trustee Cooper? Aye. Trustee Mackard? Aye. Trustee Nielsen? Aye. <coughs> the next item is actually 4.2a, which we begin our, our action items here, our consent items. And I have some changes that I need to ask you to um, pay attention to. The first is under the uh, section of certificated faculty who are advancing to their tenure status. This is on page four of seven 
under the fall 2009 hires. There are a number of things I need to discuss with you here. The first name on the list, Andrea Hopped. It indicates that her discipline is HITCIM, and it is not her discipline. Her discipline is actually political science. Oh. Yes. Trying to hide it. <laughs> right? Not exactly. No. no. Uh, <laughs> the next change is the next individual whose name is Joy Coons. Mm -hmm. It indicates her discipline is political science, and it is, in fact, art history. Mm. We had a bit of a clerical hiccup here, so um, I apologize for that. And I also want to mention there, there are four individuals who are advancing to tenure along with this group that were also the unfortunate heir of a clerical pickup. They will be presented to you on the March 14th agenda, but for sentimentality's sake, you don't need to record this, it will happen in March, but I wanted to read their names to you because I did have a request from someone that they, they be included. Catherine Shermer, Cameron Sublet, Danielle Swantek, I'm not sure if I pronounced that name correctly, and Kimberly Taylor. You will see their names and their disciplines um, on the March 14th agenda. Okay, good. And there are two more changes, which would be on page five. Under the fall 2011 hires, Pamela Shaw Hanaz, there is a one year temp under her 8-18-11 date. Just please remove that. That doesn't belong there. Mm -hmm. She is advancing in her tenure. There was one name left off of the fall 2012 hires. These are the individuals advancing to the second year, and that is Laura Faris, F-A-R-I-S-S. -S. Laura is our Director of Student Health Services, and her hire date was 11 2911. Those are all of the changes for that section. Um, so can we do all these together or do each one? There are no other changes in uh, sections B, C, or D, so if oh, it's okay. the preference of the board, you can take them as a group. Okay, with the changes that you've just made. Correct. Okay, can I have a motion to accept? Well, I just have a question. Mm -hmm. With the non-renewal ones, and I know I, I know about the non-credit one, but so the instructional counselor for student success, this position existed because there was, what was the identified need to have this position? This is a oh. uh, position that uh, dealt with follow-up mm -hmm. and dealt with uh, students uh, during the course of the semester, and what we need to do is front load those services uh, as a consequence of the Student Success Act of 2012, and that means mandatory orientation and placement, ed planning, um, and that sort of thing. So uh, matriculation funding is going to have to be redeployed into front-loading services. Okay. So the need will still be addressed, it's just going to be different. Yeah. The need mm -hmm. will be addressed by incorporating mm -hmm. that responsibility into our existing right. academic counselors. Roads and responsibilities. Yeah. And then financial aid no longer has it. Do they still no. have a need? I know that we yes. can't pay for it because of what Correct. the state says. Yeah, so what we're trying to do is figure out where we might be able to hold for on that to that too. position with other funding. That's a critical position in financial aid. We're very distressed that we can't use the funding for, yeah. for that. Okay, any other questions? I'd like to move okay. approval. Mm -hmm. Okay, of uh, 5.1 to 5.5, I hope. Um, no, the oh, I'm sorry. Four. I'm sorry. I'm, oh, I'm up one. Uh, yeah, 4.2 A through D. Correct. Okay. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay. Um, any more discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, good. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And it is an important one. I have a, I wish I had kept all my uh, layoff notices from the school district in March of every year they give you a layoff you know if you're not uh tenured oh well yeah so um jack okay good um but that's what you're asking you know address that properly on the uh, on the importance of follow-up the academic counselors decided to um rethink how they're functioning and make it everybody's responsibility um on that the um Item recommending approval of item 5.1, and those are st uh, stipends for faculty. I'm sorry, I'm behind a little here. 
we have lists and these, of these, these are um, activities that we're paying them to do that go outside their normal uh, job responsibilities right. um, for work that we have to get done. In some cases, it's for, um, for non-credit attending meetings you know, and things that you know, they're not being, adjuncts aren't being compensated for. Okay, any questions about those? Okay, is there a motion? I move. Let's move approval. Second. Second over there. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Academic calendar. Okay, thank you. The, um, this is the um, academic calendar for continuing education for next year, and it pretty much uh, replicates um, what we've had you know, in prior years. Um, going forward, you know, we're looking at a redesign. So um, in 14-15, we're looking to um, integrate the um, enhanced non-credit into um, our banner system and have them on, on the semester system so we're all in one academic calendar. We, we could still make shorter courses within that, but that way we're not dealing with two very different calendars, two very different software systems. Um, so a lot of inefficiencies um, when, in that. When do you anticipate rolling that out? Um, summer of uh, 14, so a year from the summer, so that would be on that academic year, Peter. Um, and, um, and that's going to you know, allow much smoother transitioning. Um, and also a, great, a lot of efficiencies in how we do business on that. So that's what's you know, being recommended um, for this 13-14. It's pretty much status quo. Okay. Ms. Croninger? Um, I have two questions. One, does this calendar affect um, the Center for Lifelong Learning or no. the remaining non-credit? Correct. Okay. And have we solved the um, mm -hmm. Christmas, New Year's, Hanging over hang issue one. that we had this last year, where we adjusted the calendar. Yes, we're going into negotiations on on that with the okay. classified staff. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Can I have a motion to accept this calendar? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Thank you. Item um, five point three is. Um, New courses and course modifications that have been approved by our curriculum advisory committee. Um, you know, and a pretty straightforward. Um, right. Okay. Any discussion or questions? I was going to move approval. Okay. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> we actually could have done this with one. Yes. <laughs> but I wasn't quite sure. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Maybe next time we'll lump yeah. them all. But, I know. Uh, um, Fee-based courses. Yeah. Um, 5.4 is fee-based courses. So these are the courses that um, are new that are being offered um, for fee. And starting in fall, they'll all be part of the Center for Lifelong Learning um, when we launch it. But right now, they're, they're still fee-based courses. Okay. Any questions? Can I have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. I'll second it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And okay, thank our last you. one is state Good. funded. Good. 5.5 state funded courses. So these are um, 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 enhanced funded classes um, that are, you know, allowable. You know, these are fall into the priorities for the state for continuing education, non-credit classes. So these are the new ones that were, were, were being um, recommended. Okay. Okay. Any questions? I need a motion for approval. So moved. Lisa? Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. <laughs> okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. You're good. Thanks. We got through there in five easy steps. Yeah, but it should have been one. I, I, know. I just thought sometimes you, we have questions on calendars or whatever, but we didn't this time. Okay. We are on to business services, Mr. Sullivan. Okay. Item 6.1 mm -hmm. is the business services consent items. Okay. Anybody want to take anything off? To discuss, okay. Then can I have a motion for approval for the consent items? Ms. Kugler, you want to make a motion? I move it. Moving that it be approved? Okay. Is there a second? Okay. I'll All second. those in favor, please say aye. 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 I, yeah. You're way over there, so you don't always get to be called on. Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> so sorry. 
Um, so that's the consent items and then the action items. Um, 6.2A is resolution number 33, the budget transfers between major objects. Mm -hmm. Which is something that we do. I move we do regularly. We need to, yeah. But it requires action. Okay. So Dr. Haslam has moved approval. Is there second. a second? Okay. All those in, oops, resolution, I got it. <laughs> Aye. <laughs> she hasn't spoken, so. Aye. 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 And item 6.2B is resolution number 34, which is the augmentation to revenue. This is primarily to the categorical funds. Move approval. Okay. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Another resolution? Do we have a roll call? Trustee Aye. Aye. Trustee Aye. 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 Okay. Item 6.2C is resolution number 35. These are transfers from ending balances. Um, there's two this month. One is for the 2012-13 program review items. And and uh, the second one is for a transfer in the construction fund to provide HVAC into offices in the student services building. Okay. I move approval. Okay. I'll second. Second. And we have a roll call. Last one. Trustee Peters. Aye. Trustee Bloom. Aye. Trustee Connor. Aye. Trustee Hasler. Aye. Trustee Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And we will uh, be in closed session. We'll adjourn to closed session. Will we come back to report? Yes, we okay. will come back in here to report, and it will not be an extensively long. Time. No, it'll be way before midnight. <laughs> well, we know you're ready. <laughs> Microphone. Yeah, Veronica and I are ready. Okay. Uh, we're, re we're reporting out from closed session, and tonight's closed session, dealing with the public employee discipline um, dismissal release, the board took final action to dismiss a classified maintenance specialist employee, and the motion was made by Peter? It was made by Lisa, seconded by Craig. Okay, you did it. Okay, and the vote was 7-0. Okay. Thank you, and we will be adjourned. I That's don't it. think with any, I don't plan to object. No. No. No, no, no objection. Okay.